Hi guys, my name is Joe, and welcome to Fighting Words, the Martial Arts Library. This is a segment I call Tangent Tuesday. It happens on the second Tuesday of every month. And for today's topic, um, I'm going to be taking you guys through the process of like how I pick books. That part isn't hard, but why I have so many of maybe one type, but not a whole lot of another type. And anyway, um, I was going to actually have a bit of a rant um, today, but uh, I, I'm not feeling that anger is going to get me anywhere, and honestly, I would prefer to have um, a more positive tone for this channel. I, I'm here to spread knowledge, you know, that that's my jam. You know, I find out stuff and then I want to share it with you guys. Um, but I do think it's a good place to start. So um, this week or last week, I had an exchange with a gentleman. The subject was why certain martial arts, in this case specifically Aikido, don't show up in MMA. And his comment was that, you know, the things that are good, you're not allowed to do, you know. And I was like, okay, please explain yourself. <laughs> what are you not allowed to do that makes Aikido impossible to use in MMA? And he was listing a bunch of stuff, but one thing that came up was small joint manipulations. And again, this is a tangent to say for so for a brief tangent, um, the term small joint manipulations, a lot of people seem to think that that means wrist locks. That is incorrect. Wrist locks are 100% legal under the unified rules of mixed martial arts, which is what the various commissions across the United States have approved. <clears throat> small joint manipulations means that you are not allowed to grab and bend less than the majority of digits. So when it comes to fingers, I mean, it's hard to include the thumb in that. because The thumb slips out so easily. But four fingers are good, three fingers are good. Two or one fingers are not allowed, right? Now, regardless of how this situation comes up or, you know, the, the possibility of actually doing that while someone's trying to punch you in the face, right? Um... There was a bit of back and forth between me and this gentleman, and he was sort of, for his part, started doing a lot of your classic um, logical fallacy arguments, you know, some, some goalpost moving and some cherry picking, and eventually got into ad hominem attacks. Wouldn't really address uh, my questions, which is, okay, so what exactly from Aikido? Uh, is specifically illegal in mixed martial arts. So anyway, I feel like I got something back here. It's not a bug. It's like a it feels like a hair. Anyway, so you know, because he wouldn't tell me, I decided to do my own research. There are no finger locks in any of these. No finger locks. As far as I am able to tell, with the exception of one book that shows a kick to the groin, everything in the Aikido syllabus is legal in a mixed martial arts event. Um, this is why I have a library, so I can research things like this. So I guess the question is, why does a guy who's not really in Aikido guy, I mean, I got this stack of books here, but outside of like some drop-ins, uh, when I was stationed in Japan, I really didn't invest any time in it. So why do I have a bunch of Aikido books then? Because um, I want to know stuff. <laughs> That's basically what it comes down to. Um, in this particular case, I do look into a lot of Aikido for a similar reason that 
I look into um, so-called internal Chinese styles. I'd say mostly specifically uh, Taiji and Bagua because, you know, I, I'm stuck on the idea that any martial art that is not based on magic, right? Anything that's not like, you know, I can shoot energy from my fingertips across the room and you will fall unconscious. You know, anything that's not based on that nonsense has a practical use. And with the practical use of those particular martial arts being, let's say, less obvious than, you know, boxing or judo or Brazilian jiu-jitsu, um, I, I invest a lot in trying to understand the technical side of those martial arts and the principles behind them. Uh, because I'm trying to figure it out. You know, there's something there, I'm convinced of it. And, you know, in the instance of Aikido, for example, I think um, there's probably... If you train Aikido and then you also get good at upper body clinch fighting, you can probably find a lot of opportunities for Aikido techniques, I would assume. You know, and similarly, uh, Bagua has a reputation in some circles of being like really good at throws. That's why there's all this twisting and, you know, the looping of the arms and the spiraling motions as you're trying to throw somebody. It's not necessarily trying to hit him with palm strikes. I mean, that may also be present. At the end of the day, solo forms are a vocabulary of body movements. And it's up to the practitioner to figure them out, although optimally your instructor will help you with that. So when it comes to Aikido, Bhagwan, and Taiji, that's why I have those books that's why I have a lot of those books, because I'm trying to, you know, do independent study and figure them out and see if I can incorporate them into what I know about fighting and self-defense. Now, on the other end of the spectrum, you're also going to see that I have a lot of books on um, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu slash grappling. <laughs> I have an entire section for grappling. That's more for, let's say, generic grappling that doesn't necessarily belong to a particular style. Uh, so I have a lot of that because, uh, first of all, the idea of being able to finish a fight with a submission is appealing to me, you know. Um, I think I first got that idea into my head when the UFC came out. I don't think I, I didn't see it initially. You know, it had been out a few years before I actually saw the first event, but the idea, you know, all the martial arts magazines that I you know, was reading in drugstores and stuff, you know, were showing things like triangle chokes and leg locks. And I'm like, oh, that's cool. You know, if you do render someone unconscious, they will not be able to fight you. If you break their arm, they can't use that arm to hit you. Like this stuff made sense, right? <clears throat> and around that time, I also started to become a fan of professional wrestling, which was really hot in the mid to late 90s. Oh man, I'm so nostalgic for that. But, you know, in that environment, you also got to see complicated versions of submissions ending fights. You know, things that would be very hard to pull off on most people for real. But, uh, you know, the cool factor got me into the idea of grappling and also the recognition that I didn't really know anything about that. You know, I. I've been studying karate for years. On occasion, you know, like maybe once or twice a year, you know, we'd go over like, okay, so here's how to throw somebody and here's a standing arm lock. But we didn't really dig deep into grappling at all. And I recognized that this was, you know, a missing piece in my personal martial arts puzzle. So that's part of the reason I got them all just, you know, the discovery of how many different ways there are to break the human body, you know, using leverage and physics and stuff. <clears throat> and then I would say more than that, it's the fact that specifically in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, the ground game has gotten so complicated, you know. Um, I, I have a book 
on the X Guard, which is not a position that existed <laughs> until like the early 2000s, really. You know, um, I got a book, two books on the Rubber Guard, you know, and these are very specialized positions and the complexity of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu means that if you're not at least familiar with certain positions, you're, you are vulnerable to being attacked from those positions. So that's why I have a bunch of those books. Um, books on kicking. I actually, <clears throat> I have a fair amount of books that are specific to the art of kicking. Um, I, I think I showed one of them in one of my, you know, list of books that you should have as a martial artist. And I got that one because, again, it was like an encyclopedia of kicks. But um, among other things, um, I was visiting somebody in Augusta, Georgia, and they had a Second and Charles there. Second and Charles is a secondhand bookstore. And, of course, I rushed over to the martial arts section to pick up some cheap martial arts books. And I guess somebody had bought at least four books on a set of books on kicking, which I wound up getting. Um, so between those and a couple of others, you know, including uh, a book on low kicks that I've, was one of my first book reviews, <clears throat> and The Art of Stretching and Kicking, I include that in the kicking section. So that's another one that I reviewed. Um, you know, I like having those around. I will say, it, as somebody who's, I guess, a completionist might be the right term, you know, I, I like to check off all the boxes. I have four books out of a ten book set on kicking. I have to confess that they get sort of repetitive in the later sections of the book on, like, you know, how to work out and, you know, training your body for the kicks. And also the variations of the kicks are pretty much all the same. Very, you know, I, okay, I get it. You can jump and you can spin and you can throw them from kneeling. Okay. Um, so there's a part of me and there's a part of me that wants to get all 10. And then there's another part that's like, you know, what's going to be in most of the rest of those books. You know, I already know how to do a crescent kick or whatever. Now I just need to do it from kneeling or spinning or jumping or, you know, the other subsets that the guy has in there anyway um <clears throat> uh other stuff i have a lot of karate books including um multiple books on like the history of karate or interviews with um various karate experts and a lot of that comes from again my background as a karate practitioner. You know, it was my first love. I haven't really let go of it. Mm, excuse me. Um, and again, I like to explore solo forms because they are a vocabulary of movement. So a lot of the stuff I've gotten has been on bunkai or has been specifically bunkai. Bunkai means to break down. Uh, I'm sort of using it as a catch-all term for understanding the practical application of the movements. There are better terms to use, but I'll skip that for now. You know, uh, and also to that end, <clears throat> I have bought karate books specifically because they were a collection of kata from a style I was unfamiliar with. You know, and. Most of those forms are simply variations that you'll find in other styles. I like to use them to sort of compare and contrast. So that's why I have like a bunch of karate books. Um, I don't have as many on kickboxing as, as you might think for as much as I like. And by kickboxing, I mean like kickboxing, Muay Thai, and Sabat. Um, Fighting where you're kicking the guy and also punching him with boxing gloves and also maybe other stuff. Um, so I wish I had more, but I think I've also bought just about every one that I encountered. I actually, I got uh, a 
book in French on Savat because um, in my freshman year of high school, uh, my French teacher was taking a bunch of folks to Paris, I think, you know, for a couple of weeks. Um, I wasn't even trying to go. <laughs> I think it would have been neat, but um, in retrospect, I don't know if it was a financial thing that kept us from going or kept me from going. Um, maybe, but looking back on it, you know, ever since then, there, there I have made attempts to to get to Europe and haven't been too successful yet. Anyway, but I did make a request to him, like, you know, if you can find a book on Savat, I would really appreciate it. And to his credit, yeah, he brought one back for me. And that's awesome. And I'm probably not going to cover it in a review here because I studied French a little bit, but I'm not fluent in it. And mostly I can go look at the pretty pictures. <laughs> and crochet means hook, which is why crocheting has a hooking action. Anyway, um, I do have a lot of books on boxing, including a bunch of reprints of older books. Um, one of the more popular ones that I've actually done a review of was Floyd Patterson's, but then there's also um, uh, the the U.S. Navy's um, boxing book, and that's thick and, you know, it's another one of those that's sort of an encyclopedia of techniques. Uh, I, I focus a lot on boxing, partly because of the influence of Mark Hatmaker. Um, I, in 2005, right before uh, I moved to Georgia, uh, I went from my home of Virginia to relatives in North Carolina, and then I went to Tennessee to actually do like an intensive like six or seven hour training session with him and mostly he had me working on boxing because it's one of those things i'm sure this happens to a lot of martial artists like okay i know how to throw a punch so in boxing they only have punches this is going to be easy boxing is an art unto itself and if you come from a classical fighting background you're going to need to Keep an open mind when it comes to learning what boxing is actually about. You know, I had a lot of strategic mistakes, basically, or, or I guess tactical mistakes in the delivery of my strikes and how I was standing and moving. You know, I needed to like really dig deep into the fundamentals. You know, he had me shadow boxing all the time. Um, so it's like, okay, I need to really get serious about understanding boxing because that was apparently a, a weak side of what I was doing. Uh, and in addition to that, there's also the influence of uh, Bruce Lee's Jeet Kune Do, which was heavily influenced by boxing, <laughs> you know. So, you know, boxing in and of itself is good. Incorporating boxing into other stuff, better. Um... The where was I going with that? I had a thought. I think I lost it. Um, but yeah, getting trying to get deep into boxing for boxing's sake, because you I, I've seen people who are really good at kicking. I'm pretty good at kicking, um, but the ability to use your hands to close the distance. You can fight from the outside, you can fight on the inside. Um, you can have a, a stable but mobile platform. You can keep yourself defensively sound. That's what boxing is about. And honestly, I think anyone interested in any form of striking should study boxing at least a little bit. Uh, it's very informative and can change your practical striking for the better. Um, what else? I don't have a whole lot here when it comes to military combatives. You know, I got a few reprints and I got <clears throat> some stuff that is sort of maybe of dubious military origin, but um, I do have a lot on PDF. That's because of their availability. You can find a lot of military handbooks on PDF because the military has been, you know, printing out how to fight like we do in the army since like at least the first world war 
you know, if you're not including like saber manuals from the 1800s. Um, so I have a lot of those. Most of them are sort of influenced by, you know, the, the place and time that they developed. You know, so I have a book on modern army combatives that is very obviously strongly influenced by Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Um, meanwhile, you got a lot of army combatives that are influenced by the work of W.E. Fairbairn, um, who I have some views on that might be a little controversial as far as like what he was delivering. Um, but, you know, I, I have a reprint of Get Tough. I mean study his stuff too. Um, and that actually segues into the self-defense stuff because uh, a lot of self-defense programs have been influenced by World War II combatives. Uh, I'd say most notably probably Lee Morrison's urban combatives program. Um, I'm trying to think. I know there were a couple other ones. Um, but, you know, when it comes to my self-defense books, I mean, I buy stuff because I'm sort of an impulse buyer, you know, when it comes to martial arts material. Um, I will say that a lot of the stuff in my self-defense section is on things like situational awareness, is on, you know, softer skills like, um, you know, I... One that I recommend highly is called Conflict Communication, which is how to... It's basically conflict resolution. You know, recognizing what the other person wants and navigating a way to resolve that conflict in a way where everybody leaves with their teeth, right? You know, um, and... You know, as much as we, as martial artists, we love the physical techniques. We love the ability to, you know, have this really strong punch. You know, look how I can make the bag fold. Or, you know, look how high I can kick. And, you know, look at this, you know, awesome choke hold. Like, the second I get it on, nobody's getting out of it. All that stuff is cool. But when you're talking about self-defense, if it gets to the point where you're using any of that, there have been a lot of steps that you failed at. <laughs> and I don't, I don't want to make that sound like victim blaming. Because... Sometimes you just get blindsided, right? But, you know, things like awareness, things like de-escalation, um, things like being aware of escape routes, you know, these are all things that we as martial artists don't practice nearly as much as we do the, the physical stuff. Partly because that's cool, partly because a lot of that would involve, like, lecture work, and like film studies and um, like role play, like you spilled my beer. I'm going to get in your face and yell at you and you have to figure out a way to diffuse that. That's not as much fun as, you know, kicking the bags as hard as we can, right? So I've had to find out a lot of that stuff through, you know, self-study. And uh, you know, I, I would again suggest if you are a martial artist interested in self-defense, you start looking into that sort of stuff as well. Um, books I don't have enough of. Uh, Silat. I think I have four Silat books on hard copy. And on my external, maybe I have one. Um, one full book. You know, I have a few articles and stuff. But I really like Silat. Um, I just, there's not a whole lot available contemporarily in English. You know, I'm sure if you went to Indonesia, there'd probably be a bunch in Indonesian, <laughs> you know, or similar with Malaysia. Um, you know, of the ones I have, um, I'm a big fan of Indonesian Fighting Fundamentals by Bob Orlando. I'm a big fan of Silat for the Street by Burton Richardson. Um, I think taking a look at, um, Joseph Simonette's Silat book, he, he's got one on, uh, Jurus, which are the forms, the empty hand forms and some of, some of their applications, 
you know, and I think when it comes to forms and applications, you know, that's an interesting book, even if you don't do CLOD, you can sort of take a look at it and see what he is using their body movements for. So, you know, of the four books I have, I'm really big on two of them, and another one's also very interesting. I mean, the fourth has its own place, you know, it's very much transmitting, I'd say, more of a historical or academic, you know, this is this particular kind of silat, and, you know, here are the moves we do. You know, it, it's a catalog of techniques, and it's got a bit of history and cultural stuff in it, which is good for its own purposes, but, you know, when it comes to, like, the practical stuff, I'm really digging those other ones. Um, and I wish I had more. I wish I had more stuff on Silat. Uh, Chinese martial arts. How do I pick my Chinese martial arts books? Again, I'm a completionist. I have many different styles represented in the Chinese martial arts section of my library. Uh, some of the more practical stuff is, you know, I do have them segmented off into like Shui Zhao, Qin Na, or I guess Chinese grappling methods, which include Shui Zhao and Qin Na. And then also a section on um, Sanda, you know, those are in my library. But I also have stuff on like, you know, the various animal forms. Uh, I need to get Five Ancestors Fists or, yeah, that's what it's called. You know, that was a book that was out forever ago and I just, you know, we when I saw it, I didn't have the money to spend on it because <laughs> I was a broke college student. Uh, it's still available. It's on my wish list. Um, but yeah, a bunch of books on Wing Chun, partly because I have studied that. And, you know, because of my familiarity with it, I want to get better at it. I mean, let's face it, I want to get better at everything. You know, if if I thought it was possible, I would study everything all the time. <laughs> so I pretty much have to stick to the books when it comes to this stuff. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of variety in my Chinese martial arts section, and I know that there are some gaps in it. Um, I don't think I have any physical books on Hungar Kung Fu. I think I have kind of a, a bleached out um, copy of the Boxing Kong's Tiger Crane form on PDF. Um, so the, the photos are, are terrible and that was a part of the scanning process. You know, I've seen the book in real life before and they look better than that. Um, so yeah, I just, I, when it comes to the Chinese martial arts, I just want to see everything that they have, you know, because China as a political state isn't that old. China as a geographic location is super old, you know, and it has influences from so many different, like, ethnic groups, you know, you, the, the landmass that currently makes up China um, includes, like, several various different nations, you know, in the past anyway. Uh, maybe in the present, if we include things like Tibet and Taiwan. I bet this is getting blocked in China now. Anyway, <laughs> so I'm interested in that. Um, then, you know, more obscure martial arts, at least when it comes to, like, English language stuff. I have one book on Kalari Payat. Uh, I have a book on Vietnamese martial arts. Uh, I have a two-volume set on Bartitsu, which is complicated to define, but let's say, you know, an Englishman tried to take jiu-jitsu to England, traditional Japanese jiu-jitsu in the late 1800s, and also then combine it with, like, boxing and stick fighting and elements of wrestling and sabat. Um, you know, those things are fascinating to me. Uh, and then Japanese martial arts. Again, this this probably comes in large part because karate was the first martial art I studied. You know, and modern karate, the, the karate that's gotten spread throughout the world, has a heavy stamp of Japanese culture on it. You know, Okinawan martial arts, that culture is a lot more laid back. Then we see in Japan, which is their martial arts culture was largely influenced by, you know, the militarism of Imperial China, you know, which is why they have people line up by rank. <laughs> uh, 
Um, but I do like sort of the, the flavor of Japanese martial arts. And of course, you know, I have an entire section on judo, an entire section on classical jujitsu. Um, and then, of course, you know, books on, for instance, um, uh, Japanese sword fighting. I have a, a section on sword fighting. There's Japanese sword fighting included in that. Probably a bunch, actually, of Japanese sword fighting books. And then um, I have one... I have a section for what I call historical martial arts. I didn't have it when I did my big, you know, look at my library thing. But I've done some rearranging. In the historical section, I include a book on samurai martial arts, which includes sword work and also empty hand work. Maybe some other weapons, I can't recall. You know, and then in the ninjutsu section, um, there's some of that present. And then some of it is Ashita Kim's nonsense because I'm a completionist. <laughs> I can tell you that it's, it's nonsense for the most part. He sort of plagiarized some, well, I don't, I don't know if it was blatantly plagiarized because I think he actually cites, you know, in the back of one of his books where all this stuff comes from. Um, but like, you know, he ripped off, ripped off, man. He republished stuff in his book from, you know, Count Dante, his, you know, the Dance of Death Kata Dante that he had. You know, that's in one of Ashita Kim's books. And so is W.E. Fairbairn's um, Timetable of Death for Knife Wounds, which was in Get Tough. Although I, I'm 90% sure that was actually credited in the back of the book that Ashita Kim published. Anyway... <clears throat> Um, I bought most of Kim's stuff in, by the way, his name's not Ashita Kim. You know, that's a pseudonym. He's a white dude. <laughs> the fact that he had a Japanese first name and a Korean last name should have been a dead giveaway. But, um, I think I bought most of his books in the 90s. It, if you want to rag on me, I guess you can say that I don't have an excuse for, for keeping them around. <laughs> But I also don't like throwing away stuff that is mine. Um, but besides that, I have uh, also some stuff in the ninjutsu section from the, uh, uh, the Bujinkan and their offshoots. And that seems to have a more historical basis, at least. Um, you know, again, sort of a, a flavoring of Japanese martial arts, you know, when it comes to, like, traditional weapons usage and, um, you know, fighting principles and, you know, some of the, the taijutsu, the, the body movements. So, so that's all neat. Oh, man. I could go on like this all night, but at this point, I'm just repeating all of what I... I told you guys in that, you know, the video I did forever ago where I was running through stuff. Um, are there books that I will not get? Uh, there, there's one that I saw in a bookstore on Rumimaki martial arts. A martial art from Peru. From, the you know, an ancient Incan martial art. I love obscure martial arts. Like I mentioned, you know, I got, you know, my... My thing on Vietnamese martial arts and Kalari Payat. But this thing, man. I wanted to believe. And then I picked it up. And like, you're in your fighting sense and you go to throw a punch and you chamber it back here before you throw a punch. Like, that, that's dumb. You're telegraphing your punch. You know? Uh, and then you had about three or four throws and like one of them was done from like you know what in professional wrestling has been referred to as a greco-roman knuckle lock so you're like locking interlocking your fingers with your opponents and then throwing them somehow and it looks so made up you know um i don't know man it, that's the one book that i didn't get and I have, it, unless I find it free on PDF, I might get it then. Um, just to have it in, I'm not going to spend money on it. I'm not going to recommend it to anyone, you know. Um, 
perhaps, you know, it's been over 10 years since I saw it, perhaps in the time since then I have gained some knowledge that will maybe make me think that it's a little bit more legit. I don't know. I don't know, man. But anyway, that's pretty much the only one I want. Like, you know, in addition to Ashita Kim stuff, I've got stuff by George Dillman, you know? I, I think his Bunkai stuff, when he's not leaning too hard on the whole pressure point thing, is worth looking at. You know, because he is showing, like, legitimate techniques. It just... He's like, yeah, you can punch somebody in the back of their hand and then they're going to fall over. No. <laughs> uh, so that's pretty much, off the top of my head, the only book that I won't get is if it's, like, blatantly stupid. Um, I don't know. It, there, There is an example of an author. I don't have anything. I think his last name was Cook. A karate historian who turned out to, to be having, to be victimizing children under his care. Let's call it what it is. You know, he was abusing them. And, you know, this is several years ago. Uh, when it came out, I didn't know who he was at the time. Um, but people on the karate forum I was part of you know, there was some discussion of like, okay, is it ethical to buy his books? Because apparently the information in them is very useful, but also you don't want to financially support someone who has done these horrible things. I haven't had the opportunity to buy his books. I haven't sought them out. That might be one where I'm like, I don't know. If I get him from a secondhand bookstore, I guess the money probably isn't going directly to him. Um... But outside of that, that that might be the only condition where I wouldn't get a book. Or it's just outrageously priced. <laughs> I've seen that. I, I think uh, when I was referring to um, Randy Williams' Wing Chun books, you know, I had two of a set of three, and I looked up the third, and it's like $100. And it's on the Mok Jong, which is the wooden dummy. And I don't have one of those. So I'm not going to spend $100 to buy a book on a piece of equipment that I don't have. <laughs> but besides that, yeah, I mean, I even in some of the, the books by people who are not the most reputable or books that are not particularly well written, usually there's something in there. If like 98% of it is garbage, usually I can find one thing that I'm like, okay, this is useful information or, you know, this way of looking at this can help me understand something better or maybe help me help somebody else understand something better. So the thing is, the martial arts world is enormous. And there's a lot of room for error there. Especially since, you know, between its transmission from the East to the West, although there's still some of that in the... I mean, the, the Boxer Rebellion was a bunch of martial arts clubs, basically. Guys who thought that their internal training would protect them from bullets. It didn't. You know, there, there are Japanese martial arts that allegedly had their origins when, you know, this guy went up to... The mountains and there was a, a tingu you know a, a winged goblin type creature up there that like gave him a scroll of these secret martial arts techniques that that's a fairy tale it's not real so even before it got to the west there was some of that nonsense going you know going on but then once it got to the west you know i'd say especially during like the 60s there didn't really seem to be that in like 